Thank you for choosing to watch our video. Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon for notifications of new content. Leave us a comment and watch the other videos that we're happy to provide for you. And now, on to the sermon. I'm going to be reading to you this morning from the book of Matthew in the 16th chapter. We'll begin reading in just a moment in verses 13. What we're going to read from this morning is that that is perhaps one of the most familiar of uh, the things of uh, the New Testament. We're going to be reading about the confession that the Apostle Peter made as he made his confession of faith in Jesus Christ. Now, the confession of Jesus, uh, of Peter of Jesus, is that that is recorded in the different accounts, that is, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew and Mark and Luke. But the one with which we are most familiar is this one, taken from the book of Matthew in the 16th chapter. So read with me, please, from Matthew, the 16th chapter, commencing in verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the parts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they say, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whoso ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he the disciples that they should tell no man that he was the Christ. As we look at this reading, and more reading that we'll commence with in a moment, we find that the Lord asked his disciples who it was that men perceived that he was. These, uh, and this incident uh, is that that occurred about six months before Jesus was betrayed and was crucified. And so we find that uh, Jesus has been teaching for almost three years. People have had an opportunity to, to hear him, listen to him. And so he asked the apostles, who do men say that I am? And there was a variety of different opinions that they said that men said of him. Some said he's John the Baptist risen from the dead. Some said he's Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But then Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Immediately Peter answers, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art you, Simon Barjona. When we look at the statements that Peter makes, Peter is making a confession of what he had seen and what he had heard. And he confessed two confessions. He made the confession that Jesus was the Christ. He was the Messiah, the one that Isaiah had told about, the one that had been promised unto Abraham that of his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He was the one that was spoken of by Zechariah and by Jeremiah and other of the Old Testament writers, the anointed one, the one for whom the nation was looking. But then he made another confession, and he said, you are the son of the living God. And this is that that also was something that was foreshadowed in the scriptures, not perhaps so intently as that Jesus was going to be the son of David as a descendant of Abraham, but it was there. And we look and find passages that emphasize that Jesus was indeed to be the son of God. And Jesus said, you're Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Now, don't understand Jesus in saying, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Don't understand that passage to be saying that uh, Jesus 
and that the Father rather had given unto Peter a special revelation that he had not given to the others. Each of the other of the twelve apostles could advance it, could have answered exactly the same way that Peter did. And the reason perhaps that they didn't was because of the urgency and the quickness of Peter to respond to the question. Yes, Peter had received a message from God that uh, Jesus was the Son of God. But the other apostles had as well. They had not only heard his teaching, but more importantly, they had seen all those signs that Jesus wrought and the power that he claimed, that he had the power to forgive sins, that he knew the thoughts of men. And God had acknowledged him in their presence on this occasion and in another occasion yet to come. That this is my beloved son in whom I well pleased. So it was that Peter only confessed what he had perceived as the other apostles had perceived that God had said in regard to his son. But then as we continue reading... Join with me in verse 21. From that time began Jesus to show unto his disciples that he must go up unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the priests and the scribes and be killed and the third day be raised up. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall never be unto thee. But he turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art a stumbling block unto me, for thou mindest not the things of God, but the things of man. Peter's urgency and speedily answering the question, Who do men say that I am, was that that was blessed. You are the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. But on the other hand, to take contest and to take argument with the Son of God in a statement that he made was something that was ill-advised and certainly not advisable. And we find that Peter hastily said, you're not going to happen. This is not going to happen to you, Lord. You're not going to be taken. You're not going to be put to death. And notice what Jesus said. Jesus said, Peter, you're a stumbling block to me. Now, what did Peter, Jesus mean when he said, Peter, you're a stumbling block to me? My friends, what he meant was that Jesus was a man. And he no more longed to die up on that cross, to know the humiliation, to know the degradation of those taunts that was tasked to him than you would. He was a man. But he was a God as well. And uh, he said, you are one that are a stumbling block to me. You're tempting my human side into the fact of not doing what God wills for me to do. Uh, for the only way in which I could be saved and which you could be saved was not for Jesus to be crowned as a king to reign upon the earth without his sacrificial death. But the only way I could be redeemed and you could be redeemed was a way that was abhorrent to the Apostle Peter. You're not going to be crucified. You're not going to be rejected. But that was God's way. And Jesus said, Peter, you're not minding the things of God. You're minding the things of man. And follows then are two, three more statements that Jesus makes. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever would save his life shall lose it, and whoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what shall a man be profited if he has gained the whole world and forfeit his life? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his life? Or more familiar language is the American, as the King James Version said, What shall a man be profited if he gains the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There is in this comment, uh, or in the American Standard, in which he said, What shall a man be profited if he forfeits his life? But the word life by the uh, ones that uh, translated the American Standard, the same word in the original language is the word soul in the book of Acts, in which that the record says that you will not leave my soul in Hades, neither will you give your holy one to see corruption. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What shall a man be profited 
if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? This was a question for them to ponder. It is a question for you to ponder. It is a question for me to ponder. Notice that as Jesus talks about the matter of a soul, brethren, friends, for we do have those that are in audience that are in the part of this congregation, and we welcome you. Understand that the word soul, as it's translated in the our English Bibles, has a variety of different uses. It doesn't always mean the same thing in one place as it does in another. It doesn't always have the same meaning in uh, other places like it does in Matthew the 16th chapter and verse 26. For instance, we'll just look at three of the most common ways in which the word soul is found in the scriptures. Sometimes the word soul just refers to the man himself, to the whole man. Remember in Romans, the 13th chapter, that the apostle Paul writes to the Roman church and says to them, let every soul be in subjection to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that be ordained of God. Now what was the Lord saying in that as he inspired and caused Paul to write those words? Was he causing Paul to say, let your spiritual, your eternal part be subject to the whims, to the dictates, and to the declarations of a government? Why, well, certainly not. Jesus said to his disciples, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but unto God the things that are God. My responsibility above all things when it comes to the test is to God and if government d demands of me and commands me to do something other than that I must obey God rather than man and so the word soul in Matthew 13 just has reference to man let man be in suggestion to uh, the higher powers again we find in the scriptures that when the apostle Peter was talking he said uh, in 1 Peter, the third chapter of the flood. And he talks about the fact that we're in few, that is, in the ark. We're in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now, think about that. We're the only ones that were saved when the flood came. Just those eight people that were in the flood. What about those innocent children, uh, those babes that uh, were yet still to grow, to speak, to think? What about the child that had been begotten but hadn't seen the light of the world yet? Did he not have salvation? Was he lost eternally? Uh, we're not to understand that. We are to understand that when Peter said eight souls were saved by water, he means simply eight living beings were saved by water. That's what he means. But then sometimes the word soul is used to describe life. Life, the life that animates the man. For instance, when Jesus was born, You'll remember that Matthew is the only one that tells us, but there were wise men that came from the east. How many there were, I don't know. The world says three. The Bible doesn't say. It just says men, so there was at least two, but how many more, I don't know. But they came seeking for Jesus. They came to the authorities in Jerusalem and to the king. And when the king learned that the Messiah was born, he said to these wise men when they had learned from the teachers that Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem, he said, you go and you find out where this man is and then you come back and you tell me where this child is. I want to come and worship him myself. That was not his intention. He intended to put to death this one for he regarded him as a threat to him. But then we find that after these wise men had been there, then a, an angel appeared to the Joseph and said, you must leave, go to Egypt, because Herod will seek the young child to take his life. And so Joseph fled, taking Mary and Jesus to Egypt, and they stayed there. And then there came the message that was from God to Joseph. And here's what the Lord said. Joseph, you arise. 
you go back into Israel, for they are dead. Now watch it. Who sought the young child's soul. So, what did he mean? Did he mean that here he was interested in destroying the soul of the babe? That wasn't what he meant. What he meant was that there were dead who sought to take the life of Jesus. And so the word soul is used in that instance just to talk about that. That animates the physical body. It's found again the same way in the book of Acts, the 20th chapter. Jesus, uh, or rather Paul, had preached to uh, to uh, the brethren that were in Troas. He preached till midnight. A young man fell out of the wind. He went to sleep and was taken up dead. And then the Bible says that Paul fell on him and said, make no ado about him, for his soul is still in him. His life is still in him. And so the word life and soul is that that sometimes are equivalents. But then the Bible teaches that there is something else. And the word soul is that that is used in the scriptures to describe that eternal part of me and that eternal part of you. For every one of us are begotten physically by our physical parents. And when we are begotten, God puts in each child that is conceived a spirit that comes from him. It's eternal now, the body that I receive from my parent is going to wax old. It's going to perish. It's going to die. But that spirit that God puts in that body is not going to perish. It's going to live forever and ever and ever. And that's what the Lord has reference to when he talks about that uh, this is the soul and the Bible talks about, shows us that uh, that word soul is used in that way. In the book of James, in the first chapter, James said that you're to receive with meekness the engrafted word. Now watch it. Which is able to save your souls. The engrafted word is able to save my soul. The engrafted word can't save my physical life. I can believe. I can practice. I can love the physical word, but it's not going to restore and keep me living forever. But it will do something for me, and it will do something for you. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which will save your soul, your spiritual being. And then again in James, in the fifth chapter, James writes these words. He said, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a trespass, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one. And then he says, knowing that he that converts the sinner from the error of his way shall so save a soul from death and shall cover a multitude of sins. One that converts a sinner from his sin and turns him back to God what does James say that person that leads him has done? He has saved a soul from death. Has he kept him from dying physically? No, he's going to die. He's going to die, for we're going to all die. He hasn't kept him from dying, but what he has done, he's kept him from that eternal lake of fire that he will have a living there forever and forever. And Jesus' use of the word soul made a deep impression upon the Apostle Peter. As he wrote his first letter, he wrote consistently concerning the matter of the soul. In the first chapter, and in verse 9, he said, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. As we look in that same chapter, in verse 22, he says, Seeing you have purified your souls in your obedience to the truth. I purify my soul by obedience to the truth. In the second chapter, in verse 11, he said, Beloved, I beseech you as sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. And then in verse 25 he says, you were all going astray like sheep, but now you returned unto the shepherd and to the bishop of your soul. And so 
God has given me something. He's given me a soul. It's a precious gift. And God has given you something. It's a precious gift. He's given you an immortal soul. Now, how am I going to treat this soul that I have? How am I going to treat Since it's so valuable, because it is valuable, and the Lord asks, what are you going to profit? If you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul, what have you profited? If I gain the whole world, but I lose my soul, what have I profited? I've been given a precious gift. You've been given a, a precious gift. But how are we going to treat this gift that God has given us? Shall we be profane about that which has been given and to our charge and to our hands? In the book of Hebrews, the writer speaks about a man by the name of Esau. And the Bible says that he was a profane person. Now, what did that mean? Esau was a profane person. Did it mean that he was one that cursed? Well, he might have done that. But uh, that's not what the word means. Was he one that was immoral? Well, he might have been that. I don't know. The record doesn't tell us. But that still, were he that? Not that what the apostle had in mind or what the writer had in mind. To profane is a person that disregards holy things and treats holy things as though they were common. And Esau is called a profane person because to him had been given by virtue of the fact he was the firstborn a precious gift. And that precious gift, as far as the culture of the people at that time, was the firstborn son received a double portion of whatever it was that his father had. Isaac was the father of Jacob and Esau. And because there were only two sons, that meant that of the possessions that Isaac had, two-thirds of those possessions would go to Esau. And Isaac was a very wealthy man. Very wealthy. Yeah. And so Esau would receive two-thirds. Jacob would receive a third. But how did Jacob regard that birthright? How did he regard what God had placed in his hand? He was a hunter. Uh, and he went out. And one day he came in. He was tired. He was hungry. Uh, his brother, I, uh, Jacob, was not of that disposition. He was one that kept at home. And he cooked a savory meat. And when it was that Esau came in and smelled the food, the pottage that his brother had cooked, he was hungry. And he asked his brother, give me some of your savory food. And Jacob being covetous, and he was wrong in this. Jacob said, all right, I will, but you must sell me your birthright. You've got to give me that birthright. That meant you were going to give me where rather than I just have a third of what our father leaves, I'll receive two-thirds, and you'll get the part that I did. And Esau said, well, if I die, what benefit is to me? Well, sure, I'll sell it to you, how much did he regard the birthright that his father had given him? With contempt. With contempt. It was far worth more than that simple meal that he received from the hand of Jacob. Far worth more. And that's the way it is, brethren, with the birthright that God's given us. Are we going to be profane? And what God has given to us. And just trade it away for a morsel of pottage. What do people sometimes sell their soul for? Well, let's look at the reasons why some people sell their soul. Some people sell their soul because they love the world. When you look in the epistles of Paul, you find that sometimes mentioned is a man by the name of Demas being a fellow worker as far as Paul was concerned and others with him. But in Paul's last letter, he has this sad note to say about Demas. He said, Demas hath forsaken me, 
having loved this present world. Now just what it was about the world that Demas longed for and that he loved, I do not know. But I know one thing, he loved the world. And he loved the world more than he loved the Lord. He loved the world more and that sparkling, glittering prize in the world meant more to him than eternal life at a place with God in heaven after a while. Some individuals love the world. That has to do with the lust of the flesh. And we're commanded, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the vain glory of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of the Father, abides forever. It is said of Moses that when he was grown up, he chose rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than rather enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He had a choice just like you've got a choice, just like I've got a choice. And the choice that Moses had was the pleasures of this life. And being the son, although the adopted son of the Pharaoh, he had much riches and much pleasure as far as the world was concerned. He could enjoy many, many things that he would not enjoy in that uh, course that he chose to follow in. But the Bible said uh, that uh, he chose to suffer ill treatment with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. Now notice, for a season. However long we follow the world, be assured it's just for a season. It doesn't last always, and it won't last always for me. And how sad it is that as a child of God who has placed in my possession a gift that is so valuable that I personally have a gift that's worth more than all the monies, all the riches, the diamonds, the treasures that this world has. I have something that's worth more than all of that. Am I going to trade that away? Am I going to give it away? Am I going to trade it off for a measly pleasure of life for a little while? Is that what we're going to do? Some people trade their life and their soul because self gets in the way. They're not willing, as it were, to let God be the ruler of their life. It is they that must do all of the commanding. It is they that must direct others. And they're not willing to be submissive to the voice of one that has authority over them. They're not willing to do like Samuel did when he heard the voice of God and said, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, Lord, your servant heareth. They're not willing to be like Isaiah was when the Lord said, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Hear my Lord, send me. They're not willing to do that. And that's a tragedy. Because self does get in our way. Now understand that when we become a Christian, there is one thing we have to understand from the very beginning. God is boss. He is the ruler. He is the one in authority and one in charge. I don't question him about he wants what he wants me to do. I just simply say like Samuel, speak, Lord, your servant hears. Or like Isaiah, hear my Lord, let me do what you want me to do. Send me. I'm willing to go. Some people let the world get in their way. And sometimes we let self get in the way because we have too much pride. We don't want to submit to the things that God directs of us. There were those that lived in Jesus' day in John the 12th chapter that knew full well that he was the Messiah. And the verse says in 42 of John 12, Nevertheless, of the chief rulers, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they wouldn't confess it. Why? Because they loved the glory of man more than they loved the glory of God. And some individuals are ones that let family get in the way. I have a responsibility to my parents. That's the first commandment with promise. Huh? 
That was the fifth of the Ten Commandments. God said, honor your father and your mother. And that didn't mean just when I'm at home that I'm to be submissive to them. That means that through life, I'm to respect them because they gave me life. I live because of those two people. And whatever I am and whatever hope to be, I can enjoy because they gave me that opportunity. You remember that on one occasion, there were Pharisees in Jesus' day that uh, didn't think much about that command. They were loves of money. Uh, and so they had this little kind of a gamut in which that they said, well, you know, if we say that carbon, it's given to God, everything that I've got uh, is a gift to God. Therefore, I'm just overseeing it. I haven't got the right to give it to you, mother and father. And Jesus said, you know what you've done? You've broken the law of God by your tradition." I'm to honor my father and my mother. But when it comes to the matter of God, our parents, friend, brother, there's no choice. There's no choice. I have to do what God wants me to do. Some individuals have the idea, my parents may be lost and I'm just not willing to take a step that would indicate that they're lost. Whether they're lost or whether they're not is something you don't know, I don't know. God's the one that knows that. My friends, remember something. Huh? Being lost yourself is not going to save your parents if they are lost. That's not going to make their state one bit different. What you need to do is to show the way to them. Show them that, they love, that you love them, but that you love God more. And perhaps they'll open their ears and open their eyes to the word that you have believed and you've been obedient to, even though you know that this is not what they want you to be. And this is not what they want you to do. And some individuals sell their souls for that. Some folks sell their souls for those things that are misplaced values, uh, things that they place value on things that don't have worth that ought to be. Uh, and some misplace their souls because they see. And they will want the things they see. And they regard the things that they see as more important than the things that they can't see. Uh, my well, friend, that's not so. You can't see your physical life. You can see the, the body as it moves. But you can't see the things that make life move this body and makes you think. You can't do that. You can't see life. You can't see love. And that's one of the greatest of the powers that has to do as far as this world is concerned. You can't see that. But it's there. And friend, there are a lot of things that you can't see, but that they are there still. As you look around the world, remember that once there was nothing. The Bible says by faith we understand that God made the worlds and that we believe that he made the worlds out of things that do not appear. That he, things in the world is, and made it out of things that was nothing. How is it possible for nothing, for God to speak, and it becomes something, particularly this vast universe of ours? How is that possible? Because God is God. He is omnipresent, and he's all-powerful, and he can speak, and it be done. For well, that's what the Bible says. He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. God spoke the world into existence. Now, I see the world now. But I need to respect, to fear, and to love the power of that individual that has such power that he can say to something that's nothing, be a world. And then we've got the vast universe and all the different suns and the planets and the other of heavenly bodies. And it's so. 
by the power of his to bring something into existence out of nothing. Huh? Can you see gravity? Can you see gravity? You know what gravity is. If you climb up into a tree and you step out where there's no limb, you know what's going to happen. Huh? Gravity is going to pull you back down to the earth. Huh? But think about our universe. Huh? Think about the vastness of this earth. Very small compared to other planets in this universe. And yet this earth is drawn by gravity so that it holds in place and is held in place for thousands of years. And it makes a circle around that that has such hold and gravity upon it. And that's the sun. And the gravity of the sun keeps the earth in a stability yeah, through all these years. But you can't see gravity. And my friends, it's foolish for us to trade our souls for something that is tangible. And to trade that that is intangible for that for which we see. And the question then comes to us, to me, to you. No question about it. God's given me a soul. What am I going to do with it? Am I going to treasure it for the gift it is? Am I going to give them, him the honor that is due to him? I'm going to serve him with my heart, and my soul, and my being. Am I going to do that? Or am I going to let the world get in my way? and pride get in my way, and family get in my way, and tangible things get in my way, so that uh, I don't give to him the honor that is his. And I trade my soul for a mess of pottage. What about you? You have the same gift I have. God's not impartial or partial. He's impartial. He gave me a gift that's worth more than all the world. But he didn't slight you. He didn't slight a single person in this building this morning. Every one of us, God gave a soul. Now what am I doing with my soul? Am I seeking to protect it by honoring God and say, You're the Lord. Tell me what you want me to do. I'll do it. Is that your will today? Have you never obeyed the gospel? Then if this is your mind, that whatever the Lord wants you to do, then step out and do what he told you to do. He said, believe in the Lord with all your heart. He said, repent of your sins. Confess your faith in him as God's son and be baptized for remission of sin. That's what he said. Would you do that? Or will, it, so will you let your world get in your way. And what about those of us that might be present that have wandered away? We knew what was right and we stepped away from that. That was so precious. Are we going to let pride keep us from taking that step of acknowledging that we are wrong but we want to be right with God? Are we going to let the matter of this world draw, which we know is going to pass away? Are we going to let it for a moment enjoy the pleasures of this life when we know as surely as we know our name that it's going to end and someday I'm going to stand before God? Jesus said, what shall a man be profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? In the book of Revelation, there is the tragedy that shows what happens when a man loses his soul. John said, I saw the great white throne. I saw him that stood before it, those that were one from all the earth. And I saw these. And then John said that these were ones that were judged, and if any man's name was not found written in the book of life, he was placed into the lake of fire. In Matthew, the 25th chapter, Jesus spoke of those on the left hand and those on the right. And those that were on the left, he said, depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and for his angels. I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me drink. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. 
I was a stranger. You didn't take me in. And these will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. Jesus said on this occasion. Uh, if any man will follow me. Let him take up his cross. You've got a cross to carry. And I've got a cross to carry. He said, let any man, if any man come to me, let him deny himself. That's my cross. That's your cross. And take up my cross and follow him. But remember, for every one of us that have a cross to bear, because we're serving Christ, there's a glorious crown that awaits at the end of life's way. And they're not comparable. Are you here this morning and are ready to step out and do what God wants you to do? To guard that gift God gave you that is worth more than the whole world. Jesus said, a man that shall save his life shall lose it. But he that loseth his life for my sake and the gospel shall find me. If you accept the invitation, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?